Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we have Ken Kausen with us. Hello, Ken. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce the crew very quickly, and then I will uh, let Ken uh, do the talk. So we are um, the Madrid Groovy User Group. Uh, we've been doing Groovy related talks for probably more than a ten, more than ten years now, or something like that. Um, if you go to that web page, madridgroup.com, we have a lot of we record all our talks. So we have like as I said, eight or nine uh, years of recorded talks. Uh, pretty much all of them are in Spanish. So if you know Spanish or want to improve your Spanish. Uh, you can go there, uh, but now we uh, we are doing also um, English talks with the speakers uh, with amazing speakers from around the world, uh, and that's all. Um, so what else? We also have uh, an open collective, um, basically because we do this on our own time. Uh, we don't have or really big sponsors or sponsors at all. So basically, uh, we do this to pay for the domain. Um, and uh, meetup and things like that. So if you want to uh, collaborate with the group, feel free to, to donate something in our open collective. And these are our sponsors. So Adaptabiz, Adaptabiz um, is our main sponsor. The sponsor, they paid for the meetup now, and also we are using their Zoom account for, for doing this. So thank you very much. We also have V2Boost. It's a company here in Madrid. They do a lot of uh, stuff with, with Rails. They have also offices in Brussels. Uh, we have JetBrains. We will raffle a uh, JetBrains license at the end of the talk. If you uh, sign up on the Meetup, uh, you can win the license at, at the end. Uh, OCI also sponsored us. They used to pay for the drinks that we had after the Meetups. So now we don't have in-person Meetups, so we don't have drinks. Or if you want to drink something, up to you, but you need to pay for them. And also we have grids um, with the screen capture that we use for our physical meetups and everything like that. So I think that's all. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please write that on the chat. Uh, Ken can see that, and I will be able to see that and read uh, the talks after after the after this talk. Uh, and that's all. So it's now your turn, Ken. Well, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. I appreciate your being your willingness to allow me to make my presentation in English. Um, I can assure you it's way better than my Spanish. Uh, I think if I say hola, I pretty much used up everything, um, but I'll be happy to learn more. Uh, if you do decide, by the way, to ask a question or put a, in a comment in the chat in Spanish, then um, Yvonne is kindly offered to translate for me. But otherwise, I'll be able to keep an eye on the English ones that are in there. I uh, see, oh, Shimon see we have somebody from Nicaragua as well. Wow, that's wonderful. Uh, for what it's worth, I'm based in the United States in Connecticut. And basically, if you have a rough idea where New York City is and a rough idea where Boston is, I'm pretty much halfway in the middle. So I'm on Eastern Daylight Time. I think that's probably about six hours different from what you are six yeah. hours earlier there. All right, let me share out my screen here. So I just have to pick, pick the right box. And let me, uh, so I, first of all, I have a GitHub repository with all the code I'm going to show you. And let me actually show you that link right away. So I imagine I'll, uh, as people trickle in, I may have to repeat this again, but here's the link for the GitHub repository. And uh, the I'll show you the Gradle build file that I'm using for this, but to summarize, I'm using Java 11 on this, although I don't think I need Java 11 for anything in particular. I think everything I'm doing, even in Java, is on 1.8, but I, I've moved to the current long-term support version. I have run Java 14, and I guess next week 15 comes out but I'm sticking at the moment with 11. I'm using the latest version of Groovy, the 3.0.5, and Kotlin upgraded yesterday to 1.4.10, so figuring what could go wrong, I updated today. 
my repository to that one. And all the test cases seem to pass, so I think we're okay there. The other thing I'll point out is you'll notice right in the root of this project, there is a PDF file, and that is the PDF of the slides that I'll be using. I'm going to use my slides here as basically Google Slides. That's what I use as the presentation. But I extracted that as a PDF and added it to the root of the repository. It does make it a little awkward to update it if I change the slides or anything, but this is the easiest way to get everything to you, I think. Uh, so you're welcome to any of those resources that you would like. So, okay, this is talking, this presentation is going to talk about features from functional programming. And I'm going to talk about Groovy and Java and Kotlin. And I got to tell you right up front that of the three languages, Groovy is by far the most capable in terms of functional programming concepts and capabilities. Kotlin is not bad, but Kotlin feels like, you know, I, uh, if I can, no, wait a minute, we're recording this, aren't we? So I better be careful what I say politically, <laughs> but now uh, what the heck. Um, I often have referred to Kotlin as groovy for cowards, uh, meaning that Kotlin locks down all the data types because they're really, you know, they're really afraid. You might get the data type wrong. That would be a problem or, or they make sure, you know, nulls could be a disaster. So we don't ever want that to happen. So we make sure everything is not null and nullable. And there's a lot of safety related things inside Kotlin. But the biggest difference that between Kotlin and the other two languages is how young it is so that it doesn't have as many features as Groovy has naturally. And I expect things to improve in Kotlin over the next few years, but it's still got a long way to go to reach the flexibility and the power that automatically comes with Groovy. So as you can kind of tell, I'm going to be emphasizing Groovy during this presentation, but I'm going to show you the functional features in all three languages pretty much. I talked to someone who once told me, I, I said, I referred to Kotlin as groovy for cowards. And he said, oh, he laughed. And he said, he sometimes referred to Kotlin as uh, Scala for dummies. <laughs> Interestingly enough, because of the, the, the Scala has such a rich complex type system and Kotlin makes it a lot simpler, a lot more straightforward. So again, just a, mostly a gag to give you a sense of what they're about. Here's my contact information in case you need to reach me. As, as Yvonne said, I'm, uh, my name's Ken Cousin. It's Cousin like the relative, even though it doesn't look like it. Uh, there's my email address, homepage, blog, Twitter handle. I have a free weekly newsletter, which you're welcome to take a look at if you like. And then again, there's the GitHub repository that I'm gonna be using for all the source code. You can see from the books over there that I've, that I've written in the past that I have spent a lot of time in the Java world, the Groovy world, and the Kotlin world, as a matter of fact. And the fact that I've got, and you see that that one book on Gradle recipes for Android, well, that I learned Gradle because I came out of the Groovy ecosystem. And even though the Gradle people like to pretend it's really a Java system, they don't really think much about the Groovy heritage. I, that's where I acquired it. And because I spent so much time working with Android for a while, that was partly the motivation for learning Kotlin. Kotlin is the definitive language for Android. I think that over the next couple of years, you will find fewer and fewer Java-based applications in Android, and that's already begun. I think something like 60, 70% of the top thousand Android apps are already in Kotlin. And I was surprised to hear that there were that many Java apps still remaining. So that's really the definitive motivation for Kotlin is to do Android. And also Gradle has a Kotlin DSL, although I, I don't use it that much. I'm happy with a Groovy DSL in Kotlin. So any rate, uh, here. So uh, for what it's worth, I am a, a Kotlin training partner for JetBrains, and I would do something similar for Groovy if there was such a program, but uh, there isn't. And of course, there isn't for Java either, not directly, but I, my day job primarily is teaching training classes, software development training classes. So uh, that's, I spent a lot of time on that. Um, all right, so first things first, none of these are really 
functional languages. They're all, they all share a common heritage in that everything compiles to bytecodes. Everything runs on the JVM. In fact, a lot of people would argue that Java's biggest contribution to the industry is not the language at all. It's the runtime environment. It's the fact that we have a platform independent runtime environment that everybody can compile to that has its own mechanism, security model, everything. And that allows a lot of innovation to go on on the platform in languages that are not Java. So Groovy, of course, has always been the closest to Java in syntax, and the move to Groovy 3 made that even closer, you know, now that it supports the Java syntax for streams and lambdas and method references and everything. It really is pretty close to saying any Java code you have, you could pretty much rename it as .groovy and it will probably compile. It wouldn't be idiomatic, of course, but it would probably work. Well, Kotlin is another one of those non-Java JVM-based languages that compile to bytecodes on the JVM. Uh, the others that would be the ones that get a lot of market share, if you will, would be Scala, of course, and then Clojure, Clojure with a J, which is essentially Lisp or I suppose they would say a Lisp on the JVM as well. But none of them are object, I mean, none of them are functional languages. They're all object oriented languages that have functional features. Scala goes a little bit further. And then of course, Clojure, you could argue is pretty close to being really a functional language. If you really do want a purely functional language, then of course that would be Haskell and Haskell on the JVM is called Frege, F-R-E-G-E. -E. That's one that uh, Dirk Koenig talks about a lot, gives presentations on. So if you really are dedicated to functional programming, then that's the way to go. I'm gonna just show the functional aspects of Java and Groovy and Kotlin and compare and contrast them and see where there are differences. So these are all object-oriented languages that happen to have functional features in them. And those are not inconsistent things. I mean, it's not like you can't do functional programming with, uh, with OO. It's just you put your functions inside classes. That's all. And that's fine. So Java, of course, I think it was last year, maybe earlier this year, had its 25-year anniversary. So you've got a language with literally 25 years of backward compatibility to deal with. It's managed by Oracle, but as has come out recently and been very confusing. Now, of course, they, they emphasize the Java language specification as being managed by Oracle, but there are many implementations of the Java language specification. The one directly from Oracle would be arguably what they'd call the reference implementation in an earlier generation. It's like they used to release a spec and then a reference implementation like the servlet and JSP spec, if you remember those, had as its reference implementation Tomcat. Well, the Java JDK that comes from Oracle was arguably the reference implementation of Java, the Java language specification. And there's always been alternative implementations as well. IBM's always had one, and then there are generally a handful of others. Well, now with the changes to the licensing that took effect about a year ago, then they have had a bit of an explosion in the number of implementations. Now, Oracle did actually go to the trouble to open source Java, but they weren't able to open source the whole thing, partly because there's some little edge cases, device drivers, obscure corner pieces of Java that are so old and so obscure, they were not able to find the original developers in order to open source it. The open JDK project is all of the Java source code that they, they were able to open source. And Open JDK is free and always will be, whereas the Oracle JDK now, if you use it for development or testing is free, but if you use it in production, they want a license for that. And that is driving a lot of companies around the world to adopt, if you will, Open JDK. Now, one of the implementations of that is the adopt openjdk.net project, which is where a lot of people get their, their JDKs these days. You may have noticed they put out a press release about a month ago, I guess, adopt openjdk.net. They're changing their name. They're becoming an Eclipse project, and they're going to be called, of all things, Eclipse Adoptium. 
which I think is a horrible name, frankly, but naming things is hard. I get it. And, you know, I shouldn't try to defend or criticize naming when we have to deal with a language whose name is groovy. And that's always been a bit of a challenge to get that taken seriously in the Fortune 500, if you will. Uh, Azul Systems, of course, has always had an optimized JDK. Amazon on Amazon Web Services calls their version Coretto. There's one from SAP. Microsoft, I think, bought J Clarity and they use one for their cloud provider as well. So th there's a bunch of them around. Um, I'm using for the demos I'm going to do now, I'm using Java 11 from the Open JDK project via Adopt Open JDK. The current long term support version is 11. The current actual release version of Java is 14. Java 15 will be released on of course, September 15th. So I didn't even realize until recently that that was done on purpose, right? That, it, uh, that Java 15 comes out on September 15th, but I don't know how many people are going to use it. The latest statistics I've seen have suggested that roughly three quarters of the Java world is still on 1.8. And while Java 11 is growing, it's probably about 20% or so, and then everything else is very minimal and impact. If you're using the latest versions, well, good for you. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. But honestly, the functional features that we're concerned with pretty much were all added at 1.8. I mean, they've added extra methods to streams and other short circuiting things like that. And that's all well and good. But the truth of the matter is, is almost everything Java has for functional programming was added in 1.8. Now, Groovy, of course, you know, we, we know about Groovy and, and actually Paul King, the head, pretty much the de facto head of the Groovy project, wrote an excellent article that was published last year on the history of Groovy. And I, I still have to get back through it. Um, yeah, what other name would be suggested? That is a tough question. I mean, again, naming things is hard. It's just that Groovy, the original name was made with a certain sense of irreverence and that works for developers. Developers are fine for it, but is it, does it make it harder to get, to get taken seriously? I often think actually one of the keys to Java success is that the original name for the language or original, one of the original names for the language as many people know, uh, James Gosling was going to call it Oak interestingly enough, after a tree, you could see outside his office window. And then they did some kind of trademark search and found that Oak had been used previously. And then he named it, renamed the language Java after his coffee cup, basically. And I think Java is a fantastic name. It, it's now, of course, it all just means the language we know. But back then, it conjured an image of something that was kind of interesting and maybe a little exotic or whatever. It was just a really good name. Um, so I don't know. I mean, for Groovy, of course, that was back when the language was first created around 2003. And we're kind of stuck with it. So I'm not sure what we would do with it now. At any rate, Groovy, of course, is the closest to Java in syntax. And it is the most mature of the major non-Java languages on the JVM. Of course, it has a wide ecosystem from Grails to Spock to Gradle. I will show in my GitHub repository, I'm using a Gradle build. I'm using Spock tests primarily, although I'm also using some JUnit 5 tests as well. Uh, Rat Pack had its moment in the sun. I haven't seen much from it lately, but it's a nice microservice framework, if you will. Although these days, I, would, I should probably replace that with Micronaut. Micronaut, of course, allows you to write microservices in Java or Groovy or Kotlin, all three of them. Honestly, again, I want to venture a strong opinion. I think in a world where Micronaut exists, I don't know why they even bother making a framework called Quarkus. You know, Quarkus came out of Red Hat and that's fine and good, but everything they do, I think Micronaut can do and probably faster and better <clears throat> and more flexibly because they support all three languages. So I'm still hoping that Micronaut will become a major player in all this, but we'll see. Grails, by the way, still an active project, still working, you know, it's still effectively on top of Spring and Hibernate, although a lot of the internals have been replaced by Micronaut. Uh, I, I want to say dependency injection, but they actually have a lot that they could do at compile time. I think, uh, has Graham Roche, he's done talks here before, hasn't he? 
Uh, I know he's based in Spain. I think he's given some talks for many user groups in, in Spain. And he, of course, be the expert that could talk about all that. Uh, I'm still kind of reeling from the fact that 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 uh, Graham Roche joined Oracle of all places. So we'll see how that plays out as well. Now, Kotlin is a language that is produced by an IDE vendor. It's produced by JetBrains, who makes, among other IDEs and other tools, we have IntelliJ IDEA, both the Community Edition and the Ultimate Edition. Kotlin got a huge boost when Google kind of recognized the way the world was going and adopted Kotlin as a supported language for Android. I mean, anybody who wants to learn a language needs to justify it. I mean, just wanting to learn it because you're interested is, is a good motivation, but there's always competing interests for your time and energy. So for me, at least, there has to be some killer app, something I want to do that drives me to learn a language. For, for Groovy, for me, when I got involved back around 2007, 2008, that was Grails. Grails was still on the rise at the time, and I already knew the basics of Spring and Hibernate, and having a Groovy DSL simplify it, getting Ruby on Rails type of productivity on the JVM was a huge win for me, and then I started digging into Groovy and kind of fell in love with it. I mean, Groovy's pretty much still my first love as a, as a language. I mean, I like Kotlin. I, I've of course, I've been in Java since the mid 90s, but Groovy is my favorite here. Any rate, Kotlin is very much of a Frankenstein monster, if you will. They have assembled features from many other languages, and you can sometimes see the stitching where they were put together. And if you're comfortable with Groovy, as I assume many people here are, you'll see a lot of Groovy stuff in Kotlin. If you know Scala, you'll see a lot of Scala stuff in there as well. And then they borrow features from many other, many other languages right now too. So the reasons to go to Kotlin, one, as I mentioned, is Android. Another is that Gradle DSL. There are a couple of big selling points of Kotlin. One is the null safety issue that if you declare a variable, it can never be null. Be, unless you declare that it's allowed to be nullable. And then if you do declare it to be nullable, Kotlin compiler will force you to check that, you are, that your variable is not null before you're able to access any properties or methods on it. I mean, it's really very effective in that. And it's got a lot of nice features. But as I say, you'll see a lot of groovyisms in it as well. So moving on. Let's talk about how they implemented functional programming starting in Java, of course. And in Java, they use the term lambda expressions. And are they lambdas or are they closures? I mean, we know in Groovy, we use the term closure. And in fact, there's a class called closure with various methods on it. Java decided not to go with a class or an interface called closure or lambda or anything. And instead, they simply uh, reuse Oops, sorry, just trying to grab a picture here. Uh, they reuse um, interfaces. So these interfaces that have been in Java since version one, now they select an interface that has a single abstract method and let that be the reference type to be assigned to lambdas or method references on any of that. And then the parameter types and everything are inferred from context. So it's it's an interesting decision. Now I mentioned this disagreement, uh, the, the disagreement in terms between lambdas and, and closures. Let me give you a take on that uh, with the understanding that wars have been fought over less, you know, it's not obvious exactly what, there's no formal definition. But if you go back to the mathematical theory of functions, if you go to category theory and things like that, when they use a term lambda, they're, they're generally implying what we call a pure function. A pure function is a function that always returns the same outputs for the same inputs and has no side effects. So like addition is a pure function. You know, For any two numbers that you supply, you get the same answer. And if it doesn't print to the console or whatever, then doesn't have any side effects, that would be a pure function. So lambdas are intended more or less to model that, whereas a closure is a lambda that has access to the variables that happen to be in scope. We, we would say that it is closed over the execution environment. Now that's one way to define them, and there are a lot of other definitions too. And part of the problem with the term closure is that most people first encounter closures in JavaScript 
which is kind of a mess. I mean, JavaScript's not an object-oriented language, so it's sometimes really hard to know where the this variable is pointing, you know, to know what variables are actually available and in scope. So JavaScript kind of blurs the distinction. Java and Groovy and Kotlin are all strongly typed. You, you have classes. It's not just some map of things or whatever. And therefore, you do know what's in scope at any given moment. Groovy closures, yes, you can access local variables and you can even modify them. Java lambdas are mushy, like most things in Java or most things with 25 years of backward compatibility, meaning uh, we're going to get Java allows you to read local variables, but you can't modify them. They have to be final or effectively final. And then Kotlin, which is also coming. Ah, Sergio made it. <laughs> Very good. So um, Sergio has a, a, bit, a, a history a bit with Sergio on the Groovy podcast and everything. So uh, his, um, his newsletter is phenomenal, by the way, if he ever put out another one, you know. Uh, sorry, I had to do that. At any rate, Kotlin also has uh, lambdas, but they don't call them, they, they are in fact closures, but they call them lambdas. At any rate, so in Java, you can access local variables, but you can't modify them. They use the term final or effectively final, meaning you don't have to say final on the variable, but as soon as you try to modify it, it no longer compiles. The code doesn't compile. Whereas Groovy, of course, we have the class called Closure. They're all instances of that class. And what's interesting in Groovy, and this is also something that'll be interesting in Kotlin, is that Groovy closures have a delegate property, and the delegate property is used to resolve references to properties, you know, to methods or, or variables that are defined inside the closure that are not visible locally. And we see this like in Gradle build files, you know, when you have a repository and you list Maven Central as a method in your repository. For example, actually, I can show this right away. Uh, here's my GitHub, I mean, here is my uh, Gradle build file that's associated in the GitHub repository. And you see in the Gradle build file, we got this repositories block. And inside there is a method called a J center. And in fact, if you were to look at the the implementation of the DSL, the domain specific language, this block is in fact a closure in Groovy and its delegate property goes to a class in Gradle called a repository handler. And if you look in repository handler class, that's where you'll find the JCenter method. And that's the idea of a delegate and delegates playing around with delegates are partly the way that you use Groovy in order to make what you see here, a DSL, domain specific language. Kotlin has something similar, which we'll talk about, which is how they make DSLs. Java doesn't have anything like that. Even with lambdas, there's no delegate property or some other way. They really are just stand-ins for individual functions. In fact, it's not a bad way to think about it in Java to say a lambda basically is a method that could be wrapped in an anonymous inner class and assigned to an interface reference. So it's almost like the compiler generates the anonymous inner class for you. It uses the Lambda as the implementation of the single abstract method. I mean, it's much more efficient than that. That's not what it does, but that's conceptually basically what's going on. Whereas in Groovy and in Kotlin, they're much more flexible than that. So in Groovy closures, they really are true closures. You can not only access local variables, you can even modify them. That doesn't necessarily make it a good idea. I mean, there's generally better ways. You'd like to go with pure functions wherever you can in functional programming and deal with immutables. But it's typical of Groovy to give you the power and then expect you to deal with it reasonably. You know, it's the great power. With great power comes great responsibility, the old Spider-Man corollary. Now, on the other hand, with Kotlin, they call these things lambdas. And they don't have a class or an interface called lambda. Instead, they actually have a data type that looks like this. It's, it's really different. When you say, show me the explicit data type, and I'll show you that in the IDE, the data type of a lambda is parentheses for the inputs and then the input class types and you know none if it's uh, empty parentheses if there are no inputs and then an arrow and then the output type and that is in fact the data type of the lambda expressions however 
you you oh and i'm sorry one other thing you have instead of a what they call a delegate in groovy in kotlin you have a lambda with receiver mechanism where you can add a lambda to a class basically and say oh yeah that's the class that should be searched to resolve all of the properties and methods and everything like that so lambdas with receivers are how kotlin goes about building a dsl again but the part, the part that's a little confusing is that in Kotlin, yeah, you can not only access local variables, you can still modify them. So even though they call them Lambda expressions, conceptually by the definition I was giving earlier, they really are closures. So it doesn't really matter, obviously, uh, what terms they use, but worth knowing, you know, worth being aware of. Okay, so let me show you a couple of demos in Java and in Groovy and in Kotlin and everything of that. And this is stuff that is available in any of these languages. And then I'll go on and show some things that are unique that go beyond what Java can do. So again, uh, for those who came a little bit later, here's the GitHub repository. And again, I'll paste it in the group chat. And the PDF of the presentation is in the root of that. So, okay, here's my Gradle build file overall, just to let you know before I dig into the code. Uh, I've got a few plugins. The Groovy plugin includes the Java plugin, so I don't have to say anything Java related. It already says Groovy. I added an Eclipse plugin so that you could generate an Eclipse project if you don't have a Gradle plugin in Eclipse. This is the Kotlin one. Now, the Kotlin people make a big deal out of the fact that they can generate code that runs on multiple platforms. So there's not just Kotlin on the JVM, there's Kotlin that generates JavaScript. There's Kotlin that generates mobile apps, both on Android and presumably on iOS. There's Kotlin that could generate desktop apps on Macs. I personally, uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of optimism. I, I've not had a lot of good experience experiences with bi these big cross-platform toolkits. So I've been kind of reluctant to really dive into that. I'm going to stick exclusively with the JVM part of Kotlin. And that's by far the most mature and reliable. And again, since it's on Android anyway, that's the dominant one that most people are using. But I'll show you that if you go to the Kotlin website, they make a big deal out of saying we could build multi-platform apps and generate everything. And, and there are people who do that. I just, I'm not one of them. I'm still kind of in a wait and see mode on that. Now, in terms of my dependencies, I've got now, I shouldn't be using Groovy all, and in fact, in, in other projects, I don't. One of the things that happened with Groovy 3 is they broke Groovy all into all the individual pieces so that now you can have just Groovy, which is the basic one, and then Groovy-JSON and Groovy-SQL and Groovy-XML, uh, all the individual libraries added one by one modularly. This is an all container, but it's kind of excessive. It's not really required anymore. I just was keeping it simple this way. Here's my Kotlin one for the standard library that either goes to JDK 7 or 8, and 7 is pretty much deprecated, even though I'm running on 11. I use that one. I am going to use Google's JSON for one of my examples. The other big selling point, the thing you hear about Kotlin where they say, oh, you've got to use Kotlin because it's because of these coroutines. And coroutines are a very powerful way of writing concurrent code, you know, code that is going to run potentially in parallel in terms of relatively straightforward method calls. It sounds very appealing and what it competes with and what it's largely eventually going to replace are reactive approaches. Like right now, the Android world has pretty much switched. For a while, they were using Rx Java, you know, reactive approaches to Java, and they've gone, now nah, we're going to Kotlin and we're going to use coroutines, and it looks simpler. But don't let anybody tell you that Kotlin coroutines are simple. <laughs> uh, I... I spent a lot of time with those things and I'm still not sure I'm doing things correctly. There's a lot of depth to this and a lot of use cases and it really needs somebody to come in and say, okay, now we've figured all this out, let's simplify it all again. I mean, asynchronous programming is just hard anyway, but Kotlin coroutines are a very powerful way of doing that and they are becoming dominant, especially on Android, but they work also at regular apps as well. So I, in, they, it's a separate library, Colin. You see the Colin X here. So I've added it in, and I think I've got an example in there. 
Uh, here's my Spock testing. I've got the Hamcrest libraries in there. J unit Jupiter, of course, is J unit five, which I'm using. And I forget why I needed the script runtime, but I think I have a script in there as well. And then down here, the test section with the use J unit platform, that's what means that I'm using J unit five. And then these blocks are to tell Kotlin to compile under the these compiler arguments and using JVM target either 1.8 or 11 or whatever. So that's the that's the overall Gradle build file. Now I mentioned I was going to show a couple of examples and the way this GitHub repository is organized, I have a source main Groovy, I have a source main Java, and I have a source main Kotlin. Now for Groovy and Java that separation is a little bit artificial. In fact in Android apps they put all code under source main Java. You know, even Kotlin code goes under source main Java, interestingly enough. But in in the Kotlin world, they often separate the Java from the Kotlin. Here I just artificially separated all three just to mention it. Now the the first example I was going to mention, the little Lambda demo here, but I also want to show the prime checker. So let me just bring that up. So the oops, wrong one. Uh Here's the Lambda demo, and this is simply a main method, and it shows with a, an array of strings here. And of course, I could update that to list.of now, now that I'm on Java 11. And of course, we have the functional interfaces that were added to Java specifically to be used everywhere else. And consumer is one of those. A consumer takes a single argument and returns void. And in the old school, we would do this as potentially an anonymous inner class. So they added a for each method to collection, basically, that lets you iterate over a collection using a consumer as an argument. So it would take each element from the collection, do something with it, return void. And of course, here we could see the Lambda expression uh, would be a little bit different. In fact, what I'll just do just to show it here is if I do Alt Enter here, it says, you want to replace that with a Lambda? I'm like, sure. And you see they use the arrow and to the left is the argument and to the right is this is an expression Lambda. In fact, why don't I show it here, I think. Uh, strings and then here I could put in the body here and convert it. So this would be an expression lambda because I have a single expression on it here. And in this one, I could say, let me take that. And I could make it a block lambda by saying, oh, expand the lambda body. And then you see I've got braces around it. And I could even use a method reference to print, you know, to print inside there and make a consumer. You know, there's all kinds of things I could do with this. Now, let me show you that prime number checker. Now, this is Java code. So if I want to figure out if an integer is prime, this is brute force. This is not an elegant algorithm by any means. What I'm doing here is simply saying, okay, if X is less than two, then yeah, I, I, I can't tell prime numbers below two. So I'll leave that out. If it is two, then that's prime. And then I figure out a limit, which is basically the square root of the number rounded up as an integer. And I'll do a go from two up to the limit and try to divide each X by each of those integers. And if any of them divide evenly, then of course it's composite. And if none of them divide evenly, it's prime. So this sort of expression here is what I would write. And of course that has to be tested because there's just so many chances for off by one errors. And what I have here is a Spock test using Spock 2, the beta version, where I have the prime checker instantiated here, and I can expect each number is prime using this where expression, which will feed in the prime numbers. And then of course, I also have a bunch of composites, just in case all I was doing is returning true and also checking for the illegal argument exception. Now, if this is the old style, here is, the stream approach much more of a functional style. So the first parts are the same. If X is less than two, that's illegal. If, here's my limit. But notice how you can write this basically in a one liner in Groovy, or I could say either X equals equals two, or 
I can make an int stream using the range closed from two up to the limit. So range closed will give me all the numbers between two and the limit inclusive. And there's a none match method directly on stream. And none match returns true if and only if every element in the, well, none of the elements in this range satisfy this predicate. So none match actually takes a predicate, which is a functional interface that takes a single argument and returns a Boolean. So there's my simple prime number calculator. And again, in my check here, there's the one which is the new one. This is the is prime Java seven. And then I guess if I'm going to run this, I should show the groovy one as well. So here's the groovy one. And you see, it looks very similar to the Java functional one. So again, I check the X less than two. Again, I compute a limit, but this time I'm using a range from two dot dot limit. And one of the issues that comes with groovy is that since they got there first, the method names they picked don't necessarily fit in the method names that Java picked. Like Java uses map and filter and reduce and Groovy for filter doesn't use filter. They use find or more properly find all. Find here returns the first value such that this closure is satisfied. So for, and again, that integer there, that's not in the code. That's IntelliJ giving me a hint. So for each n, check to see x mod n equals equals zero. And if none of those return true, if there aren't any, then the or condition will return uh, false and this, therefore this will be uh, prime. So actually, because I've got the not in front of it, then if none of them return that, then I will be able to check it that way. And by the way, I, I, I think I would have come up with this eventually, but I got to give some credit to Tim Yates. You know, Tim Yates is a, a groovy person. And of course he does lots of things. He works for Gradle and he's just phenomenal at algorithms. So I, I check things with him whenever I need to do something algorithmically. So at any rate, if I execute my Spock tests here to check them all, um, that should happen a little quicker than it's happening. Uh, any rate, if it takes too long, I can show you that I did in fact run all the tests from the Gradle build file and they all pass pretty quickly. But doing it inside IntelliJ should at least allow me to see the unroll. I don't think I even need the unroll annotation anymore in Spock 2, but there they are. There's all the primes correct and the ones that are not prime and the illegal argument exceptions and, and all of those. So there's your functional approach, if you will, to prime number calculation in both Java and in, uh, sorry, in this one, in Groovy as well. Okay, now the map filter reduce one. In Java, let's make that full screen. Here again, I have a collection of strings. And if I want to sum all the lengths of the strings, this is something you have to do in Java. See, I want to, this is actually key to Java's approach to functional coding. In Groovy, the methods like find all and, and collect and inject, all these things have actually been added to collections so that you can actually, you don't need this intermediary of stream. Java introduced an intermediary or what they say, all problems in computer science are solved by adding a layer of indirection, you know? So they use this stream instead as a default method in Java to create a stream that's a different interface. And then we have map to int, which says, I want to apply this method reference to each element in the stream. So this says invoke the length method on each element in the str each string in the stream here. And map to int means I want to transform not into a stream of integer, but rather into an int stream. And an int stream knows I'm using primitives and therefore they know we have a sum method on there. So in order to have a sum method available, I need this mechanism to convert to an int stream. In if I want to sum just the length of the even length strings, then I can throw in a filter as well. And then we see our typical map, filter, reduce. This would be the odd ones. And in fact, you can take these predicates and in fact, make them constants 
and define them as, as attributes here. And I think I have a test case for this, don't I? Yeah. So that I can actually reference those odds or evens this way, or I could provide my own uh, lambda expression if I like. Now, in fact, this one is a Spock test. So this is a groovy test for my Java code. So I can check the sum all lengths of the default collection and sum the even lengths and the odd lengths, and then I could make my own lambda and provide it here. And of course, that's a method. And this is the old way of doing it. This would work in Groovy too. The basic idea being that I use a closure where Java is expecting a lambda. Now, this is the method reference syntax for Groovy. But now with Groovy 3, I think I should be able to do this. Now, again, I shouldn't be doing this while we're talking, but let's see. Uh, here's the method reference syntax. And likewise here, uh, this would be the lambda syntax, which in Java would look like, let's see, I need a paren here, and I'll go s arrow s dot. Uh, actually, s is... Um, s mod 2 equals equals 0. So it's really n, isn't it? n arrow n mod 2 equals equals 0. And there's the syntax that uses Java Lambda expressions. So if I execute this, just make sure it passes here. That's one of the features of, oh, I got an error here. Uh, didn't get the even one. So that, yeah, my sum of strings turned out to be 12 on this one. So I'll, I'll have to, to check. Yeah, I've had some issues with that. Actually, it's not that one. It's this one that turned out to be an issue. So I did something. Oh, <laughs> I see what I did. Silly. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so again, Groovy 3 now allows you to use Java syntax for lambdas and for closures. So there's, there's the idea for method references and for lambda expressions. All right, now let me go on and let's talk about what Groovy does that's a little bit different from what Java does. So as I mentioned, Groovy didn't unfortunately use the terms map, filter, and reduce. For map, this is the biggest problem. They use the word collect when they meant map. And I imagine if they had to do over, they would call it map now. But collect is kind of intuitive. It's saying apply this closure to each element and produce a collection of the results. But unfortunately, Java uses the term collect as a method to convert a stream back into a collection. Now, find all, I would argue, is a better term than filter because if periodically I run into Java people who go, wait a minute, does filter mean allow these elements through or, or keep these, you know, filter out the ones that satisfy the, the predicate? See, it it's, can be interpreted either way, even though we know it's only allow once through the pass the predicate. Find all, well, I know exactly what that does. Find all the values that satisfy this closure. So that one I like. Reduce is in Java. In Kotlin, they have both reduce and fold, interestingly enough. But in Groovy, that it's called inject, which is an interesting choice. So that's kind of unique. And if I look at this closures in Groovy one, so here's closures. then this is the sort of capability you can do in Groovy. I can make a closure and assign it to a variable of type closure. Oh, the Kotlin plugin update is available at long last, right? Yeah, what could go wrong? Let's, let's not restart though. Okay, so closure class has a call method that you can invoke, or you can just use parentheses to invoke it directly. And of course, Groovy's optional typing allows you to use any classes such that, that whatever class X is has a plus method that takes a Y. So here with integers it works, and here with strings it works, and even here with local date and, and an integer, 
in fact, because of the operator overloading in Groovy, you can add three days to a local date and that works. And of course, they also have a minus method in Groovy too for many of those. And you could even use variable argument lists and sum an arbitrary number of things. There's one, two, and three. You can do another nice thing in Groovy that you can't do in Java, which is to set default arguments even inside a closure so that this is actually basically overloaded so i could invoke it with two arguments and i'd use three and four here for x and y or just three and y will take the value two in that case another thing groovy has that java does not is a curry method which allows you to create a new function a new closure by substituting one of the values of the existing closure now this is a trivial one it gets really interesting when you curry a closure with another closure, where I replace one of the arguments with another one, but I don't have an example of that. They have currying for the currying from the left, they have R curry to curry from the right, there's even an N curry. All those things go beyond what Java does. Now Kotlin also allows you to put in the default arguments, which saves you a bunch of overloads, but they don't have a currying type mechanism at all yet. Now uh, I guess I should show that uh, map filter reduce in, in Groovy quickly. So the map filter in Groovy, again, it's called collect and find all. And then here's a sum where I'm doing my, instead of doing an inject, I know that these are integers. Also notice I didn't have to transform to a, an int stream or anything like that. Groovy basically says, look, you call sum. If there's a sum method, we're good, you know. <laughs> If not, then we'll get an error. Here, I'm actually taking strings and converting them to uppercase and then sorting them, making a new a new uh, collection and then joining them with a comma space like that. That works. And something similar here. Uh, yeah, with using it and everything. Now, when you're going to see it in a moment, Kotlin Lambda expressions look just like Groovy closures. I mean, we'll get to that now. So in Kotlin, one of the differences is they put the data types after the variable and after the method signature. So this is a function. All methods have to have the word fun on them. And I'm not going to make any fun related puns. So just letting you know. A function sum here takes A and B both of type int. So they use int here. And again, that's the integer class, interestingly enough. And then it returns an int. So this is the return type goes after the signature. But if I see something like this in practice, I would call this speaking Kotlin with a Java accent. I mean, this is Java code that just happens to be using Kotlin syntax. Whereas the idiomatic way of doing this is this one. Anytime you have a single statement as your implementation of a method, you can simply take the signature and write equals and put in that implementation. And not only does that mean I don't have to declare uh, the block on the right-hand side, I don't have to declare the return type either because it's inferred from the expression. And they go to great trouble in the Kotlin library to reduce things to single expressions like this. In fact, this is one of the things I miss in Groovy and in Java. I would love to have this sort of thing in Groovy as well. But it's, uh, it's very nice in Kotlin. And if I look at the prime number calculator in Kotlin, I got this script called primes, KT. And in fact, I went a little bit beyond what I showed in that slide here. This is what's called an extension function. So an extension function in Kotlin is adding a method to an existing class. Now in Groovy, we do that via AST transformations. You can do it at runtime as well with metaprogramming, but in this particular case, this is using, this is compile time. So this is more comparable to the Groovy mechanism of doing an AST transform. So this is adding an is prime method to the int class. And when you just assign it to an equals, this is all one line here. When you're saying the word this, you mean the integer that you are invoking is prime on, is this. So there's my this equals equals two. And then you see these ceiling and square root functions? Notice how they're imported themselves. And this is one of the things that's a little different in Kotlin. Kotlin allows you to write what they call top level functions. So if I go into the library for this, I'll go into double here, for example, you see that this is a file 
called uh, actually below constants. See, there was the class of constants, and then in this file called um, uh, which file am I on? MathJVM.kt. These functions are at the top level. There's no class wrapping around them. Now, what this is for is it's the it's basically for static methods. See, because Kotlin, like Scala, doesn't have the keyword static. So they put functions in a file by themselves, call them top-level functions, which you can import in everything. But if I was going to call this from Java, I'd need to know the name of this file, MathJVM, because then it would generate a class called MathJVMKT, and this would be a static method in it. Now, the actual keyword is about, again, going back to that idea of, um, let me say it again, the, let me go back to the one I was talking about, the ceiling function or the square root function. That's going back to the idea of multi-platform so that they can declare a method as being available on a bunch of platforms. And then the actual implementation on the JVM is here. And notice how, again, it's a one line implementation. So this is doing native math.square root or native math.exponential or et cetera. And you see how much of the library is written in terms of these top level functions. So I can simply import the function in Kotlin. Again, if I was gonna call it from Java, I'd need to know the generated class name. But at any rate, this is the ceiling of the square root of the number. And here's a quirk in, in Kotlin. This is an integer, and I can't go square root of an integer because it won't promote it. And the reason it won't promote it is because these aren't primitives. They're the wrapper classes. You can't just assign an integer instance to a double instance. You have to convert it. So I convert it to a double so I could take the square root, build up my range. See, there's the same range syntax from, from Groovy convert it back to an int. So two up to the integer version of the ceiling of the square root of this double. And then their method is called none, which is like the none match one in Java. And you see, again, we've got what looks exactly like a groovy closure. And that's what they do. And we've got, I've got a bunch of variations on this as well. So just to give you an idea uh, what's doable here. Now, I think I have, oops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, I don't, I have a test for this, but I don't have it in the the class that's name test exactly like I was looking for. Uh, here's the primes test. So these tests, in fact, are JUnit 5 tests with parameterized tests and a value source. And the back quotes allow you to put in a, an expression for the name, which again, you could do in Spock, and then it'll provide each value inside. JUnit 5 has really closed the gap between what JUnit could do and what Spock could do. Spock, I still think, is a bit nicer. But JUnit 5 is actually not bad at all. And in my Kotlin book, all my tests are using JUnit 5. Just happen to be the tests are written in Kotlin here. And you can see there's the, the primes less than 20 and the composites less than or equal to 20. And I even have a method source and all that stuff. So I've got a lot of tests in, in, in store for all that. OK. Now, Java streams are lazy in that they only process as much data as you have to, and no data is processed at all until you have a terminal operation. Well, Groovy added methods to collection. So these are all eager, and Kotlin did the same thing, actually. But if you want to say, well, how am I going to do things lazily in Groovy if I want to? Well, you could just write Java code in Groovy and it works. So if I look at my lazy streams over here, so for example, this guy, here I have a range from 100 to 200. This is Java code. I filter them by the numbers divisible by three. I map them to their doubles and I find the first. And this looks very inefficient because it looks like I'm doing a hundred filtering operations and then th roughly 33 map operations and then I only want the first one but in fact because of the way Java streams work it's taking each value and going through the pipeline entirely and then going to the next value and I show that down here because this filter and this map go to a method reference and all these method references are are the same operations with a print print line to say we're inside each of them so if I go to the test case here, then 
if I actually let's do the verbose one so you can see it actually execute. Uh, yeah, I know IntelliJ has problems when I try to execute a single test, but if I execute the class, then they work. Uh, whoops, compiler problem. Uh, oh, did I mess something up on my spec over here? Oh, I typed a couple letters accidentally, didn't I? Where did I put that? Here. There. Sorry about that. Okay, let's try again. Right. And what you see when I look at the verbose one is I'm actually, uh, let me bring up the code again. Here's the verbose one. I'm only doing four total calculations. It starts with 100 and it says, are you divisible by three? No. So we go to 101. And then are you divisible by three? No, we go to 102. And that one is divisible by three. So it doubles it and then find the first and we're done. So this is that one of the features of laziness in that we are going through the entire pipeline and it doesn't matter what this upper number is as long as i have you know enough to get through three of them i'm only going to do four calculations total whereas if i look at this in groovy now so my lazy streams in groovy then if i do collect directly on the range I mean, this is my mapping method. I'm going to double all those numbers and then find the one divisible by three. I guess I should do those in the other order. But still, this is going to go through way more calculations. See, this is doubling all the numbers in the range and then doubling the one that the ones that made it through and then finding the value I wanted. And here's the verbose one that's just printing out the numbers as we go by. But you know, if you want to be lazy on this well what the heck this is the java code i'll just use an int stream and a filter and a map and everything and i left this as groovy closures but again now in groovy 3 i could write that as regular lambda expressions in java and i'm good see that one's laziness that one's lazy so here are the numbers being written on the groovy calculation now colin doesn't work like that colin doesn't say oh give me the you know we'll let me rephrase. Colin works with the collections directly. And if you want laziness, they had to introduce that into the language. And the way they did that is with sequences. So Colin has a class called sequence and they have an add sequence method to convert a collection into a sequence. And now we have all those methods all over again. So if I look at lazy sequences here, Then here's find the first double using collections with version one. Here's map done directly on a range. Now the until method there is the corresponding one for Groovy's dot dot less than. So that's 100 to 199. Whereas if you did 100 dot dot 200, it's inclusive. So this is exclusive. So this map will print out, hey, I'm doubling it and then multiply by two. And see how that looks exactly like a groovy closure, except I do need parentheses. There's no optional parentheses in Kotlin. And then here's a filter. And then here's a first. And then IntelliJ is trying to tell me, by the way, they made a better filter method, uh, a better you don't have to filter and then do first. They made a better first method. And here's the first method with the closure right on it. So you could simply, this one is the first one. Here's version two that simplified a little bit. And then if I want to use sequences, then you take this and this time I'll go up to 2 million or something and say as sequence. And now each element goes through them one by one through the entire pipeline. And we get the first one and we're done. So that's what, Kotlin did to handle the same problem that Java did via streams. And Groovy says, we don't need to re-implement the wheel, if you will. You know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, got it. So let me show a couple of bigger examples uh, going from here. So there's your basic stuff. And here's a summary of it in the slides. In Java, Um, in Java, oh, sorry, in Java, you've got filter and map and reduce, and here's a reduce with a binary operator, and here's your map to int in case you want to do sum. See, this is 
this is a map which generates a stream of integer, so I need to use reduce, whereas this is mapped to int, so I have a sum method. In Groovy, we have collect and inject, which looks similar, and of course the the closure goes outside the parentheses and Kotlin does the same thing. Whereas here I could just say dot sum and if there's a sum method available, we're good. I mean, what the Ruby people call duck typing inside there. So that works as well. And in Kotlin, interestingly enough, they have a reduce method if you don't give it an initial value or the identity, op, op, or the identity value here or a fold method if you do. So the fold method takes two arguments. The the initial value and the lambda, whereas the reduce method would only take the lambda, if you will. I don't know why they went with two different method names for that. I Generally on things where I'm not sure why they did it, I probably should blame Scala because that's probably where they got it. I don't know Scala well enough to know. Um, they do have a sum method, however, if these values are integers and they know they're integers, so that would work too. And notice how these, these lambdas look just like Ruby closures exactly like it uh, and then of course I could make it a sequence and it works exactly like a Java stream I mean there really is no difference there uh, question is sequence and implementation of stream I don't think so I think again it's their own um, class inside there but I'd have to actually check the details on it but it's an easy way to find out because uh, where's my sequence one here uh, as sequence, if I go inside the method here, then you see it returns a sequence. And notice, see, this is an extension function. As sequence added to iterables of type T returns a sequence by returning a sequence with this lambda on it. If I go look at the sequence class, it's just an interface here. And I don't know that they actually connect it to streams in any real way. So I think they reinvented the the, you know, I, I usually call it reinventing the flat tire is that's what happens when you reinvent the wheel and you get it wrong. But they apparently built their own mechanism in front of that. Okay, uh, let me skip this. Colin, you know, Groovy has pogos, which we know about. Colin has data classes you know, that have, that look very similar. Java, in Java 14, has records. Now, they're a preview feature in Java 14, and I think there's still going to be a preview feature in 15, but in Java records, you're going to have a class that implements two string and equals and hash code and is final and allows you to put a constructor in there and all this kind of stuff. Um, we'll see how that evolves over time. Kotlin data classes also add a copy method, which is like a copy constructor, and these component methods for doing destructuring, which I'm going to skip at the moment. Now, what can we do beyond the basic map filter reduce stuff that Java has in it? Now, I already mentioned currying, but there's also something for closure composition and then this basic cool stuff with memoization and tail recursion. So in Java, Here's the combine lambdas one. So combine lambdas. In Java, they don't have an arbitrary class for lambda expressions. You have to pick a functional interface. And predicate has a method in it called and, and there's a method called or, and a method called not. And this is how you can take individual predicates, like not null and even length, and combine them. So you could combine two predicates or you could combine two consumers. Here's the info method on a logger and here's print line on system.out and I could say do a logger and then a printer and you'll see how this works. So the red ones are the logger and the ones in darker text are the printer and it's a race condition basically because they're both going after the, the standard output but you can't combine a predicate with a consumer or a function with a, with a, uh, what would be another one, the supplier or whatever, you know, it's, it's all only the methods they've added and the methods they've added are explicitly in for the same type. And if you wanted to go beyond that, you'd have to add your own functional interfaces and find a way to do it. Whereas in groovy, on the other hand, if I look at composition dot groovy, so let me bring that one up. You know, composition, we have the left shift operator as a way of combining closures. 
or the right shift operator will do the same thing as long as I make sure I do it in parentheses here. So this guy right here will say, okay, I want to do, let's see, multiply by two and then add three. That's what this one does. So if I take five and multiply by two to get 10 and then add three gets 13, yeah, that's right. So I could do them individually just to prove it. Or I could use the right shift operator and this can be used with basically arbitrary closures. As long as they make sense, you know, that the output of one is the input on the next, I don't have to pick a specific data type and, and I'm restricted to those, those mechanisms. So this is far closer to the functional programming they have in mind. Now, Kotlin doesn't have this. Kotlin instead has you write your own. So if I bring that up, this was taken directly from their reference docs. They wrote a function called compose that takes an F function and a G function. And the F function takes whatever generic type B is and maps it to a C. And G takes an A and maps it to a B. And the overall thing maps an A into a C. And here's the implementation. It says, take any X and execute F of G of X. So as an example, here's length. This calculates the length of a string. Here's an is odd method, which calculates whether a, an integer is odd or not. And therefore, I can use my little compose up here and to say, reference the is odd and then the length to build my odd length function. See, this is returning a lambda so that then I could call this filter on odd length. But boy, that's a lot of hoops to jump through just to build this. So again, I think this is a symptom of it being early in Kotlin's life cycle, you know, that they don't have the same power that Groovy had built right in and their, their commitment to adhering to strong data types means they have to know the data types everywhere, whereas Groovy has the, the closure class and is a lot more flexible on that. Okay, last couple of things and then I have a, a nice little bigger demo. So. Groovy has some AST transforms like tail recursive and Kotlin has the keyword tail rec. And it's a lot easier to add an AST transform than to add a new keyword to the language. So for example here, let's close all these. If I bring up my annotated functions here, then here is Groovy. This is Groovy code that says I'm going to do a memoized on this Fibonacci calculation. I mean, Fibonacci is a classic example of recursion that leads to an explosion in the calculation. Well, you throw a memoized on there and what it does is it will keep a map of results for each calculation. So if I calculate Fib of one, it'll save that in the map. So if I have to call Fib of one again, it'll just pull the value out of the map. So this transforms this from an explosion in the number of calculations to just one calculation per number. And here it is on factorial as well. So I could write recursive functions and memoized will get rid of the memory problem associated with them. And uh, I can show that, actually I have a test on this. So what you can see up here is the Fibonacci numbers, those, this will show they all work. Here's the Fibonacci or the factorial with the memo eyes, those all work too. And then um, actually I had a better example here. Yeah, so here's the tail recursive one and the tail recursive here says, I'm gonna call factorial, which is gonna call itself with different arguments. That and with tail recursion, that has to be the last thing you do. And there's my, call recursively to factorial. And this allows me to reuse the stack frames when I'm doing the recursive calls. And therefore you can go to enormous numbers. You can go to 70, 80,000 on these things. And on Kotlin, uh, I think it looks like, oh, I don't, uh, on Kotlin, then what I have up here is um, my algorithms KT class. I think that's what I called it. So let me just bring that up real quick. Whoops, brought up the wrong one. Uh, at any rate, it's, the Colin has the keyword instead. All right, since we're running out of time, let me just show you a couple last things. So first of all, the Kotlin language is somewhat limited in what it could do functionally. 
but there are libraries and the dominant library for functional programming in Kotlin is called Arrow. And Arrow is the one that lets you actually talk about functors and, and um, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, it's the concept that anybody who can explain it can't, doesn't understand it and vice versa. Uh, monads, yeah, thank you, <laughs> exactly. So they have monoids and monads and all that. Uh, actually in the Arrow library, which I find extremely dry. I don't find that as helpful, but there are books being written on functional programming in Kotlin that will get into all that. Of course, in Groovy, you can use any Java library you want, including various functional libraries that have been added to the language. Uh, I'll skip the metaprogramming one here, but I will show uh, the palindrome one, and then I think I'll go to the cat pictures, and that's how we'll finish it. So to just show you a palindrome idea. Here is the is palindrome method executed as a an extension function on string. It converts everything to lowercase. It replaces this. This is what we call a raw string with the triple quotes. So this is the regular expression, not a word character, as a regex, and replace it with an empty string. So this gets rid of the punctuation. And then Kotlin has these cool things called scope functions that let you chain a call onto an existing system. So this says, after I've done the replace, then let's do this block which is to check that the value is equal to the value reversed. And just like in Groovy, equals equals will invoke the dot equals method. See, this would be the same thing as an ispal method, where you convert to lowercase, do the replace, and then return this. I mean, this again, this is more Java style than Kotlin style. This becomes a single, um, a single statement. And you can see I've got my palindromes here, like a Santa pets rats as Pat taps the star step at NASA and all these paths. And then here actually is a palindrome that goes on for 543 words, believe it or not. Uh, so all of those are in there as well. And there's even, you know, the groovy thing is similar. Now I did want to show you the cat pictures, which is what I'm going to finish on. So let me bring up the cat pictures here. Now it takes a little bit of explanation. First of all, Groovy, this is going to download cat pictures from Flickr. In fact, I think I say something about it here. This is the RESTful web service that I'm accessing. So let me show you what I mean. Um, I'll open a new one. So this is the Flickr photo search. And you build up a URL, and these are the arguments that go to it. It doesn't require any authentication, which is what I want. I do have to get an API key, and I'm going to give you my key, because what? why not? Um, and then there's lots of other data that comes out of it, but, uh, here's like, this is an example response in XML. I don't know why they show the XML one. I'm going to use the JSON one, but you see how you get a block of photos that has several photo elements in it that have all these properties like owner and secret and server and, and all that stuff. And then there's a mechanism you can use to convert these properties into the URL for the actual image. So with that in mind, here is my endpoint to go to that RESTful web service. Here are my parameters in Groovy. I'm going to say this is the method I'm invoking. I did download my key. I put it in the Flickr key.txt file, which I'm reading out of from Groovy. I want JSON data. I'm going to put in the word cats. Now, I have to be really careful here. Let's actually try kitties. Because again, I don't know what I'm going to get back. <laughs> okay, this is a risk here, I got to tell you. Because, I mean, I've gotten tractors, you know, I've gotten dogs and monkeys. And every once in a while, I'll get something really inappropriate. Because it's whatever files are, are tagged at, at Flickr with the word, whatever the tag is, kitties here. Kitties sounds like there's a good chance I'll get cats from that any rate, then what do I do? So here's your normal Java approach or a Groovy approach. Take a map. So this is a Groovy map and do a collect with it because the to string method on map.entry is key equals value. So doing the collect on the map will convert it to a list of key equals value. 
uh, um, expressions and then join them with an ampersand. So this builds the query string from those parameters. And then I inject the endpoint in the query string into this overall groovy string, convert it to a URL, and download the JSON data. And now I've got the JSON text. I'll write it to a file. So I'll make a file, and if there's anything in it, I'll delete it. Groovy will let you pretty print it, and I'll write it to the console. And then I'll parse it, and Groovy has a JSON slurper built in. Java still doesn't, you know, you still have to use a third-party library for that, and Kotlin doesn't either. But Groovy has one, and therefore I'll go dig out the photo elements. Go down to photos.photo, and now I have all the photo elements. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert each photo into an image. And I'm going to actually print which thread I'm on, because I'm actually going to do this using Java Parallel Streams. Because why not? So here I'll print out the thread I'm on and the title of the picture. And this is the pattern for the URL, pulling properties off of the photo elements as a JPEG. And this will actually read them. So this method is going to get invoked as a method reference inside this parallel stream. So I take all my photos and for parallel, grab them all and turn them all into image instances. That's java.awt.image, actually, believe it or not. And so this will download them and collect them all into a list. And then this uses Groovy Swing Builder to actually build a frame with the images in it and say for each image, make a J label with an image icon that has that image on it. Now, this is actually kind of silly doing it in parallel because I only have six and it's actually going to take more time to split it up and do the multi-threaded download than it would just to download them all consecutively. But what the heck, it's a neat demo. So, all right, keep your fingers crossed that if it's really inappropriate, I'll just close it. But let's see what we get here. And, oh, I got cats. Okay, good. I'll put that in the win column. So these are all cat pictures. Yay. Oh, thank goodness. And there were the, the common pool worker threads to show uh, actually it's six threads going at once, including main. And there were the titles that were on each of those pictures. Looks like, I don't know if that's Korean or Japanese or Chinese. I'm not sure exactly, but then you can see the rest of them and it worked and, and thank goodness. So this is a nice example of combining Groovy and Java. And I didn't see a reason to add Kotlin to it and I could, I guess, but it was nice doing Groovy with, with, with um, Java parallel streams. And it's all in the GitHub repository if you want it. So in conclusion, you can use all three languages together. As you see, I've got all three in the same GitHub repository and there's no problems. And I use Spock tests for Java and for, well, I use, generally use JUnit tests for Kotlin, but you could. Um, Java functional capabilities are there, but they're kind of limited. Groovy goes way beyond them. And with those AST transforms, there's all kinds of power there. You've also got traits and metaprogramming and more and more. Kotlin has some of it, it has its own quirks. And again, there's the GitHub repository, which I will, in fact, what I'm going to do now is I'll go back to this page with all the contact information on it and the repository. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask them. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go here and update the GitHub repository. So let me do a git add. So I don't see any um, questions at the moment. But feel free. I mean, I'm sure Shimon has something as well. <laughs> At any rate, there they all are in the GitHub repo, and now I can leave that up so I can show you the link for the repository. And uh, My favorite Groovy 3 feature, um, I, I guess I'm happiest about the fact that I can use regular Java expressions in Groovy now, because the method reference syntax especially was different. You know, Now, actually, that's an interesting question about the Kotlin testing mechanism, because when I was writing the book, I thought I was going to use a Kotlin testing library and the favorite Kotlin testing library kept waxing and waning. You know, it didn't seem to be a definitive one. Some people like Kotlin test. Some people like, I think there's one called K test. There were, there's a bunch. 
And uh, since I couldn't pick one and I didn't want to write the book about testing, I mean, I just wanted to write tests. I picked JUnit 5 you know, as the easy way to do it. I will say that um, Mock K, M O C K K, does seem to be the definitive favorite mocking library for Kotlin, even more than Makito. But for the raw testing, I, I still am not sure I, I see a clear winner in that yet. And I, I didn't want to learn one and then have to unlearn it and learn a different one, you know, so I just went with that. Uh, the Groovy 3 features, I mean, a, there, a lot of it is small stuff, but I like the fact that I could use Java syntax in them now, especially with the method references. The Lambda expressions, I'm fine using Groovy closures, but it's, it's nice to be able to take regular Java code and just paste it in my Groovy code and then refine it or whatever. Uh, and the Kitties example could be the same if you use, whoop, sorry. <laughs> if you had any others. And we can give people. Hi, Ivan. Did you have something you want to say? No, I just want to say that we can give people a few minutes to ask a few oh. questions. Oh, sorry. Just looking at, at um, Avaro's uh, comment there. Uh, you could use pairs. That's right. And do collect parallel. And yeah, absolutely. And in fact, Kotlin has a class called pair. Uh, so I think when you said G pairs, I think you meant Jeepers, G P A R S, the Groovy Parallel Library. That's right. And what I'm worried about with Jeepers is I don't know if anybody's working on it. And I've been very disappointed that it hasn't really caught on, even in the groovy world, because it's really incredible. They've got actors. They've got software transaction memory. They've got everything in that thing. I mean, it's just a phenomenal library. And yet the documentation is dicey. There's a lot, but it, it's not always up to date. The samples are, are old. And again, a lot of Groovy people aren't using it. So yeah, out of Jeepers, they have Collect Parallel, which would be great. And in fact, I used to do that. But here I was trying to show off the interaction between Groovy and Java and what the heck. But I'm, I'm concerned about Jeepers. I mean, I'm concerned about Groovy in general, you know, because just not getting the uptake I was hoping in certain areas. Because again, it's still my favorite. It's still the one I want to use. And I actually, actually used to have a presentation that I called Use Groovy Now. <laughs> It's like, seriously, use Groovy now just to try to get Java people to, hey, look, this is so easy, and all you have to add is a class or whatever, you know, but it's um, it's not clear. Now, if you are seeing people using Jeepers and you're seeing that it's out there, yeah, please say something about it, because that, that would be great, because I really think they did a great job. I just don't know if it's still being maintained and updated at all. I'm sorry, Yvonne, so just responding to that. Don't worry. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, feel free to keep in touch, you know. I've got that's why I've got all my contact information up there. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all. Um thank you very much Ken for joining us today and give this talk in our group. Um I'm going to finish the recording. Please don't leave because we are going to do now the um, the raffle. Thank you wow. very much.